Join me in welcoming Lubna Bouza, Editor-in-Chief, Sky News Arabia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all and thank you for being here. I'm delighted to be back in Riyadh for the FII this year and to moderate this special summit on redesigning tourism. Uh, we will have three panels back to back with different topics, different speakers. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists today. His Excellency Zayed bin Rashid Al Zayani, Minister of Industry, Commerce and Tourism, Kingdom of Bahrain. His Excellency Dr. Ahmed Al Falasi, the Minister of State for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, United Arab Emirates. And Her Excellency Gloria Guevara, former Minister of Tourism, Mexico. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Your Excellency, let us start with you. Um, strong travel and tourism industry is key um, um, to kick start the economic recovery. Bahrain uh, announced two days ago uh, a new tourism strategy uh, to promote Bahrain's uh, position as a global tourism center, uh, increase the contribution of tourism to the GDP, run us through the main pillars, strategies, and uh, initiatives and projects um, to do this. In 10 minutes? Uh, <laughs> um, take all the time you want. <laughs> uh, okay. First of all, uh, if you allow me, I'd like to uh, congratulate the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on the fifth edition of FII. Uh, we're certainly fascinated uh, by the progress that's being made, and uh, we're, we're really happy to be seeing faces again and uh, shaking hands and seeing people amongst friends, family, brothers and sisters. So congratulations, uh, well done, great job, great organization, uh, and we wish you all the best. Uh, uh, we launched our tourism strategy a couple of days ago, which we termed as uh, Tourism Strategy 2.0. In essence, it is a follow-up on the first tourism strategy we launched back at the end of 2015. Uh, which took us to 2019. We were, we were anticipating the second version. COVID kind of uh, dictated the, the timing. Uh, there was no sense of launching a tourism strategy when the whole world was locked down and the mm -hmm. hospitality and aviation sector was practically paralyzed. Uh, the main features of the strategy are building upon the first uh, version, which, which we called back then the four A's. The four A's were awareness, attraction, access and accommodation. And this is how we built our tourism product and our uh, offering to, to the world. Uh, we managed to succeed in the first strategy to, to double tourism's uh, contribution to GDP to 7%. Uh, so we met that target. In this new tourism strategy, everything kind of heads that way, that by the end of 2026, we want the tourism sector to contribute 11.4%. Uh, it will be a big uh, challenge and a milestone to us because this is, will be the first time that the tourism sector contributes double digits to the GDP of Bahrain. Uh, it's quite a detailed strategy. We, we go into deep dives of each of the four A's. Uh, but in essence, was what we're doing is we're expanding the reach of Bahrain. Uh, the first strategy, we looked at seven key markets. and this one, we're looking at 18. Uh, we've tied in more Gulf Air, our national carrier, into the tourism initiatives. Uh, so they work together in launching new routes or enhancing existing routes in terms of frequency or capacity of aircrafts. Uh, that coincides again with the modernization of Gulf Air, which started with the new strategy of Gulf Air in 2018. Uh, and they work together to promote Bahrain jointly. So the airline can benefit, the tourism sector can benefit. Uh, I think it comes at a timely manner because we're, we're noticing recovery in the tourism sector. Uh, Q2, uh, we had good numbers. Q3 is showing positive indicators. And we are about to start having meetings like these in Bahrain. Our first and largest event is Julia Arabia, 16th of November. 
I'm sure you'll be there. I hope so. I'm, I'm sure I okay. will. I'll make sure I will. So that will be the first public audience. And it, 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 may, it marks for us two milestones, actually. One is that we'll have a public event where we have public audience attending. And two, which is a bigger milestone, we, during COVID, we converted the convention center into a COVID center. Mm -hmm. So we had testing, we had a vaccination center, and now the, the center is back to being a convention. So you really center. believe that the industry is ready to scale up? Big time, because we are actually in the midst of constructing a new center, which will be ready by October 2022. Uh, and again, parts of the new strategy are built on the mice sector. We believe that Bahrain can position itself as being a mice uh, destination. Uh, and this is why we chose to be, build a much larger center, 100,000 square meters of exhibition halls, plus another 25,000 uh, convention center with a 4,000 seated auditorium. Uh, we are going after the global uh, mice market, and that's one part of the strategy we have there. Good. Let me move to your, uh, to your, your Excellency, Dr. Ahmed. Speaking of scaling up, um, today at Expo 2020 Dubai, uh, more than 190 countries are showcasing their cultures and innovations was a very brave decision of the government to take, actually, to do that uh, at this very difficult time, I would say. Uh, and sure, it took a lot of collaboration uh, between those countries to make it happen. Tell us more about how different was the plan put by the government to do this from any other event that you have done before. Sure. So first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, His Excellency Ahmed Al-Khatib for the warm hospitality. It's always great to be back in Riyadh. I vividly remember in end of May when Riyadh received the Middle Eastern members of the UNWTO to meet here. And he told me, Ahmed, if we as ministers of tourism cannot come in person and discuss tourism, how do you expect the tourists to come in here? So thank you again. It's good to be here uh, in person. When it comes to Expo, I think this is a great testament of how could a government First and foremost, put a very strong healthcare foundation. The UAE has invested heavily in ensuring that we have high vaccination rates. Today, 97% of the population have at least received one dose, and 87% are fully vaccinated, so we ensure a very strong base. And then secondly, to be able to make that right balance and thin balance between economic activity and um, public health. So if you go back a few months back, Tokyo has hosted the Olympics. And unfortunately, no international visitation was allowed. Mm. And as soon as the Olympics started, the decision was made to not even have domestic tourists or um, viewership to attend the stadium. So it was highly cautious, highly controlled event. Uh, in Expo, I think, with the um, widespread uh, vaccinations in the country, uh, by offering it as well to delegations in the country, with the scale of Expo and the open air mm -hmm. system designed, it actually encourages people to, to really explore. So I think, first and foremost, there's a confidence in the system. Uh, and secondly, it's also the collaboration of all of the countries. We have extended support to countries to participate, whether by offering pavilions for those who can't afford it, but also by offering vaccination. So I think it's the location of the UAE, it is the commitment to healthcare, it is also the need to explore. People want to travel. Uh, being in, in, in the pandemic for a year and a half, People want to go see the world. I mean, what better place than to go to Expo and explore all the different cultures? But we still have continuing uh, restrictions, travel restrictions in place. Don't you think that will be a challenge? Well, I think, look, um, a lot of countries, especially those that were successful in the first wave and were very much praised, have fallen into this pitfall of trying to perfect it. So some countries, like New Zealand, for example, pursued a COVID-free policy. Mm -hmm. But until recently, they realized that's almost impossible. It's a moving goalpost. You can't seek perfection if you're moving in a, an ambiguous um, atmosphere. So I think uh, we continue to see restrictions being lifted. Some countries have removed quarantine completely. But I think the UAE and Saudi Arabia as well, being open 100% uh, uh, in public places, including the holy sites of Mecca and Medina, including um, Muslim Riyadh or a Riyadh season, sends a message that you can still open up and have economic activity while maintaining public health. And I think more countries who have been very adamant about the public side, the public healthcare side, will soon shift to a more balanced approach. So, so the 25 million um, 
you um, hope to attract yes. uh, over the uh, course of six months? Still a doable target for you, you think? Well, you, you've already, I think we've, we're already around 1.5 million, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. This is the number I read a couple of days ago. So. Correct. Correct. So we always aim high in the UAE. And I think 1.5 million in the beginning is a good start. Uh, about eight days ago, the airport received 100,000 passengers in one day. Uh, even Emirates Airlines, for example, they recalibrated the forecast. They previously forecasted air travel to go back to 2019 um, levels by 2023. Mm -hmm. The reforecast says it'll reach 80% by 2022. So we are optimistic, and the UAE is always welcome to uh, receive tourists, be it leisure or business. I'm, I'm glad that we, we have a lot of positivity on the uh, panel. But Your Excellency, COVID-19 wiped almost four trillion from the global travel and tourism in 2020. Uh, sectors contribution to the world economy almost half uh, um, uh, after the pandemic. Almost, almost half, dropped almost half. Uh, so many countries announced different initiatives. We hear about the initiatives announced by Bahrain, what uh, the UAE is doing. Do you think really that we are on the right track for recovery? Absolutely. And let me just tell you first, besides being the minister, former Minister of Tourism from Mexico, I am the former WTTC CEO, which represented the global private sector. And I have the honor and pleasure to be a special advisor for His Excellency here. So it's an honor to be here today. And, and also very thankful to have tourism at the forefront in this very important conference. So thank you, uh, FII and Your Excellency, for this. I totally believe that we are in the right path. And, and Saudi and the region is a great example. The amazing job, for instance, done here during the pandemic and after for domestic, very impressive, and the recovery has been amazing. And I think that now with the right protocols, I think we're gonna be recovering very fast in international. Middle East is ahead of the game, very clear in every single indicator. Uh, I think that we're better off than other regions. Of course, Europe is doing very good as well. Asia behind. His Excellency mentioned the example of uh, New Zealand. I totally agree. Some countries risk adverse, close borders, not only New Zealand, Australia, many countries, in, uh, for instance, in Asia, they don't even know how to start the recovery that's going to be impacting, and they are looking to this region. Mm -hmm. I think we still need to do some coordination international, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, I see that, especially the growth. There are definitely uh, a lot of challenges. Your Excellency, let me, let me talk, talk about financing. I like to talk about that a lot because there's nothing that we can do without the right financing. And uh, the sector, and this is what, you know, like all the reports uh, recently that have uh, been pointing out that we are suffering tight liquidity. Is that so? And if that's the case, what can be done? Uh, I mean, I could talk specifically about Bahrain, mm -hmm. if, if I may. Uh, yes, the sector was the hardest hit. Uh, in my addition, as in my role as Minister of Tourism, I'm also the chairman of our national carrier, Gulf Air, so I've seen both sides of it. These are probably the, the two worst affected sectors, aviation and uh, hospitality. Uh, but we realized that at the very start. Uh, and in Bahrain, we took the decision not to stop our airline. We're one of the very few airlines in the world that continued flying. Uh, throughout the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, we chose to, to keep the airline going. Uh, we converted a lot of our operations to cargo and repatriation trips for Bahrain and beyond. Uh, and I think that gave us a new experience that we probably wouldn't have ventured into in the first place. It's opened up a new line of thought for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's developed the company, it's put us under a stress test, and I think we, we learned a lot of lessons from it. Uh, also, uh, thanks to His Excellency, our Minister of Finance, under the, the guidance of the leadership in Bahrain, His Majesty and His Highness the Crown Prince, we started a very early economic stimulus package uh, back in, in March of 2020. Uh, and it was 33% of our GDP. It was designed to be front-loaded heavily. So we give a, sh a strong boost to the economy uh, in order to preserve jobs, to sustain companies, to stabilize the shock. Uh, you have to remember what we know about COVID today is much more that, than what we knew back in March. Uh, a lot of the panic was because of ignorance, because of fear, because of the unknowns. 
Today, I think the whole world has relaxed more about COVID because COVID has become more of a reality, something we have to adapt with than, than something we just run away from. Mm -hmm. That package continued on a quarterly basis uh, and on, on a more specific or targeted basis. So instead of being, the first package was more of an umbrella to all the companies, much wider, uh, much bigger amount. We started narrowing it down to the sectors that continued to be affected. Mm -hmm. For example, in the second wave, we noticed that the supermarkets were not affected. In fact, their business grew because people were buying online and some, in some instances they were buying more than they consumed. So we, we took a decision to divert the, the assistance to somebody more needy. And it continued to the last batch, which was quarter, the fifth quarter that was uh, Q1 2021, specifically to the hospitality and aviation industry, sorry, quarter two, uh, 2021, because they continue to be struggling. Uh, that has helped us, and you have to take into consideration that we are not a big country where we could encourage domestic tourism. Saudi has done a fantastic job in encouraging domestic tourism because they have the geography, they have the popul population, they have the diversity. Bahrain is a much smaller geographically bound country, uh, although there was domestic tourism because people wanted change of scenery for, for the lack of anything else, but we couldn't, it couldn't be sustainable enough for the industry to maintain its, its uh, livelihood. Mm -hmm. uh, so having started with, with dealing with the, with the medical problems very early, the medical issues related to COVID, it gave us foresight to look into the economic aspect, which we did, and we are now in phase three of our plan led by His Highness uh, the Crown Prince Prime Minister, is to sustain and grow the economy. Mm -hmm. I can talk as a Ministry of Tourism, during the pandemic, we had one hotel closed, shut down, and three new opened, and we have six about to open by the end of the year. Yeah. So in fact, if you look at it in absolute numbers, the number of rooms has grown, the number of, of offering has grown. Uh, Gulf Air added two more new routes, uh, in the pandemic, we've added Singapore and Tel Aviv, which were not on our network in the past. Uh, and we are now going back to open more routes which were planned originally for 2020. Mm -hmm. So the growth of the airline with the growth of the tourism industry, I think the liquidity, the liquidity is there because the financial system has liquidity. There is no shortage. So what's the problem? The confidence maybe is not there. But once they start the flow, seeing the flow is there, the government support is there, I, like I said, we have hotels opening. These are all private projects, so the investor confidence is there. None of the construction projects stopped during the pandemic. I mean, they stopped because of labor issues and, and uh, isolation and all that, but not because of funding. Uh, and, and I think we're going to see an accelerated program now to finish what's in the pipeline to catch up on the lost time. Thank you. Your Excellency, um, you served on both sides in private sector as a business leader and in the uh, uh, government, as part of the government in different ministries. When the pandemic hit, were you happy you were a minister? What is the <laughs> set of challenges that, that the pandemic brought to your table? Well, I'll tell you what, I was appointed in July 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. So I don't think it was the best timing for me as a person, but it was the best time to deal with it. We had to really roll up our sleeves. But what we quickly figured out was that Countries globally, naturally, when you are in a pandemic and economic um, uh, crisis, you use your tools, right? Be it monetary or fiscal, and we did that. But with tourism and also with small and medium enterprises, uh, we found out later that they much prefer the ability to open up their business and have economic activity as opposed to a fiscal stimulus by giving paycheck protection and so forth. That's exactly what we did. So the UAE invested heavily again into healthcare. We were able to keep businesses open while at the same time having a very agile system that meets on a weekly basis, monitors the situation, and then adjusts the uh, COVID restriction requirement. Mm -hmm. That to us was far more appreciated. And the numbers say it. So if you look at the numbers for uh, 2020, sorry, for half one of 2021, we had the highest hotel occupancy globally, 62%. And that's because of the confidence of the tourists, the confidence in the system, 
And I think that to me is the biggest tool, especially when it's a healthcare related pandemic, is to try as much as you can to give confidence to the investors, um, to the retail owners, and to the tourists to be able to come to the UAE and to spend a good time there. So that's the biggest learning for us. It's economic activity being open, as opposed to pumping more money into it. And as His Excellency mentioned, liquidity is there. The biggest, I think, um, issue was how can we open in a very safe manner? Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Although, you know, having said all that, we still have reports asking for more restrictions, for uh, more quarantine time, um, different uh, protocol put in place in different countries. And that is somehow uh, could be limiting for any recovery to come. You've mentioned um, international coordination. Do you think it's the biggest challenge we have now? It was the biggest challenge uh, during the pandemic. I can tell you that, international coordinations. But there was a positive side as well. Saudi hosted the G20. And under the presidency of Saudi, we made history. Because for the first time ever, we had the private sector in the same tourism ministers meeting with um, the leaders. And that was crucial because in that event, a lot of things happened. That conversation helped us to move faster. There was a plan requested by Saudi to recover 100 million jobs, the Alula framework, and several other things. The international coordination is crucial. We need to get it right. That was a great example, leader in the world. We need to continue with that. Saudi has continued with different initiatives to coordinate everyone. That's why we're here. WTTC is here. We have leaders from the public sector, the private sector. That collaboration is fundamental for our sector. It's not only to put tourism in the forefront that we are here with leaders of the financial sector, with investors, but also really make it a priority as, as Saudi has done it. And when we are growing, not only in the country, we're growing in the region. The minister said something very important yesterday uh, in his panel. Until tourism grows, the economies will recover. So if tourism recovers, the economies will recover. 10% of the global GDP, that's a contribution in the sector. One in 10 jobs. And when you consider all the jobs that were created before pandemic, in the last five years, new opportunities in all the sectors around the world, one in four were from travel and tourism. So if you don't have that coordination, we're not going to recover. There are yeah. great examples mm -hmm. that we have seen, but we need to continue with that coordination. So that's why I think it's very important to follow this leadership and what Saudi is doing. Yeah, and, and building on that point in particular, since you mentioned that one of four of all jobs created were uh, across the world uh, was accounted for uh, tourism. The sector uh, was definitely uh, hardly hit by uh, COVID. 62 million jobs lost. And every time I speak to anyone, uh, the first thing they tell me, I'd, first of all, they don't want to study anything that has anything to do with tourism or hospitality or aviation. And, and even people in the same industry, uh, people that lost their jobs, they don't want to go back. So how important is this to be uh, a priority on the agendas of the governments so we, we can bring back the talents that we lost? As you say, 62 million jobs, are livelihoods, not only jobs, right? And when they were lost because of this lack of international coordination and because of the situation that we had, I think it's very important for leaders to understand the priority of the sector. When the leaders understand the priority of the sector and they help us to facilitate, they help us with the right policies, like in this case also, not only in Saudi, but our uh, excellencies here from Bahrain and UAE and the region, I think that's when we drive change. And then when they value the sector, but we need to make sure that we have the right platform. We need to make sure that we work together. We need to make sure that we facilitate that process and that understanding of what the private sector is doing to create good jobs, well-paid jobs, and jobs that will stay there longer, while at the same time are supported with the good policies. Only working together, that's how we drive change. And when you look at all the sectors, yes, the, the, the pandemic impacted us all. But it was sad to see that in some countries just decided to close international without a domestic strategy or without the right policies in place. And those people are still suffering. And that's why we, the platform of the G20 was crucial. And also sharing best practices, which is something that Saudi has been doing. Traveling all over the world, bringing the region together, sharing protocols, sharing knowledge. That is fundamental. Mm -hmm. We should continue doing that. 
I think more and more you will see people very excited about when you have a clear vision. That's what I have seen here with the 2030 vision from His Royal Highness. Very important, where do we want to go with the 100 million visitors that we want to have and 1 million jobs? People are very excited, and, and, and that is great. And I think this country has everything to become one of the top five. But as you say, we need to continue with that coordination internationally because tourism brings, uh, reduces poverty, brings opportunities, and, and provides a lot of benefits um, around the world. Not only, for instance, in this case, in the region, in our countries, but all over, the spill is, is amazing. Your Excellency, anything to add? Sorry? Anything to add? Anything to add? I think uh, we believe that the worst is behind us. Uh, we, there are lessons to be learned from COVID, uh, how to work in a team. I think the biggest success we achieved in Bahrain, particularly in many, many countries in the region and beyond, is if you look at the successful models, that was a true cooperation between government, private sector, and the citizens and, and residents of the country. Uh, law was respected, the regulations were respected, we came out of it faster and quicker. Where countries where, you know, regulation was not necessarily put in place in a timely manner, where, you know, the general public did not cooperate, uh, they still, some of them still continue to struggle. So we've learned how to uh, combat it. And I, I always remember the words of His Highness. He says, we are at war. Oh my God. And it was a war yes. against COVID. We did not fight with arms, but we fought with our will yes. and with, with our perseverance. And I think uh, soon, inshallah, we will, we will celebrate the victory. Inshallah. Then to wrap up this panel, I'm just going to give you some the main messages. Uh, from our panelists. So global coordination is key going forward. Work together to create jobs and bring back talents. Uh, no economic recovery without a proper recovery of the trouble and tourism around the world. Keep going. The worst is behind us. And yes, we are on the right track. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You. Let's hear a big applause for our panelists. It's, it's okay now? Good. Okay, so, uh, so sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, we will be uh, continuing with our summit. Uh, for the second um, panel, we will have one Spanish speaker. So in case you need translation, you will find the devices next to you. You can use them. And I would like to invite on stage then uh, Her Excellency Riz Mortoro, 
Ministry of Industry, Trade and Tourism in Spain, Julia Simpson, President and CEO of the World Travel Tourism Council, Kelly Craighead, CEO of Cruise Lines International Association, and Her Excellency, Her Royal Highness, Princess Haifa Al Saud, Assistant Minister of Executive Affairs and Strategy, Ministry of Tourism, KSA, and Greg Ora, CEO of Satras. We're having a technical problem. I'm so sorry for that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So let's start this panel by asking Your Excellency uh, Rees, the Minister of uh, Tourism in Spain. Uh, Minister, tourism is obviously a vital industry for Spain, uh, as it is in many countries, including developing nations. How has Spain adapted during the pandemic? And so you think that the tourism industry needs more multilateral yeah, coordination and cooperation to strengthen in the time of crisis. No, I don't need. Uh... Okay, I think we have a technical problem. Yes. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, they're trying to fix it backstage. Just bear with us. So now maybe you say something. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me in the headsets? Ella decía, ¿cómo vamos a reforzar la economía turística en España? No sé si la había oído. Que... Perdona, Julia, dime, dime. Sí. Que ella preguntaba, ¿cómo vamos a reforzar la industria turística en España después de la pan pandemia? Yes, okay. 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 Okay, no. okay, I don't know. You start, start the, is it, is okay, okay the now? question. Okay, perfect. Okay, good. So, Minister, tourism is obviously a vital industry. Let me make sure you're, you can hear me in Spanish. How do I sound in Spanish? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Is it good now? Good? All right. So, uh, it's a vital industry for Spain. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, I understand, I understand. Yeah. Bueno, en primer lugar me gustaría agradecer al eh, ministro de, de Turismo de Arabia Saudí, a, a la viceministra, su invitación. Para mí es un placer estar con, con todos vosotros y, y una satisfacción poder hablar en, en este importante foro de inversión de turismo, porque el turismo es una industria y ponemos el foco... It is a pleasure for us to, uh, be in this event. Uh, the, ev the tourism industry is very important, not just for Spain, but for all of the world. That is one of the, uh, as we heard, it was hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, and we hope that we will be able to overcome this pandemic, and we will recover in the next period. And 
In terms, and there is another important point that 80 percent of our people received the vaccination. Regarding our Spanish society, it is very important. We have a system of health care public health care that faces a lot of challenges in order to add value and to add a uh, better assurance for the domestic and international visitors and tourism people and they will be also uh, we will use the health passport and we will also have uh, 43 countries that can visit us and also 28 countries with different systems and uh, we also have tools that will be utilized in order to be able to facilitate the movement, the continuous movement forward to achieve sustainability during this period and in this critical time to encourage investment in the field of tourism as for different tourist, touristic products. We will also invest in that um, uh, sector of tourism in innovative ways, and we will also provide different offers, flexible offers, through which we can attract investors and present tourism services in a better and a faster way and in an easier way in terms uh, with other uh, with other friend countries. We also have, in, our, in Spanish tourism, we have two main important factors that we take in our priorities. The people all over the world and also the institutes that provide education for our staff and the challenge to transform our the current situation and to face the challenges using digital possibilities and capabilities on the levels of individuals and organizations as well and on the higher level or a general level of the organization. We will focus on all of these points to advance toward the future. This is what we can do in the coming period. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we had no references. Uh, uh, when you take a step back now and think of what uh, the kingdom has done so far, how you evaluate it? I think um, the pandemic, when it hit, it hit uh, everyone, and it hit everyone hard. But the number one lesson the pandemic has taught us is that we should never take this industry for granted. Tourism, everyone realized that they have a stake in it, a stake in tourism today, a stake of, in tourism in the future. And we can see that in the numbers that we saw. We're talking about $4.5 trillion lost globally from the global economy which is 50% of what tourism used to contribute before the pandemic, completely lost. 60 million jobs completely lost. Everyone realized just how incremental and how important this sector is to all of us, especially when it's a human-centric industry. Looking back at Saudi Arabia and what Saudi has done, has done over the past two years, I think um, it was very important to realize that we needed to work together. We needed to work cross-sectoral with different industries um, in order to have a proper recovery, but also with the private sector. We needed to enhance this collaboration, to sit down on a table together, listen, and understand what the issues are, agree on what the issues are, and set a way forward. How, how can we strengthen the sector as we rebuild Absolutely, I think that's a very important point. You know, um, tourism, we have realized, is a very vulnerable sector. And um, with everything that I just told you, you know, I used to be an investment banker. And during the financial crisis back in 2008, we said, banking is too big to fail. Sure. Today, I am telling the world, tourism is way too big to fail. And on that point, we need to make tourism the center stage, as we have made it the center stage of the FII here today. By making it the center stage, I want to focus on three key things that we need to do yes. uh, moving forward. One, enhance coordination and collaboration. Saudi has done through, so through its G20 part, uh, presidency last year, where we brought pri private sector to the table and engage. However, we need still more permanent solutions for this continuous collaboration. Two, 
We must reach a consensus. We must agree on what are the issues. This is why we have launched the principles of redesigning the future of tourism, where we have spoken to hundreds of governments and private sector around the world to understand what these issues are. And then finally, we must agree on a clear roadmap and a way forward for this. One that provides opportunities, as again, we need to look at the human element. Saudi has uh, introduced a global uh, training academy in order to support, but there are much more opportunities with job creation. If, uh, second, sustainability. Clearly, the se sector is not that resilient. We need to focus on the environmental, social, and economic elements of it. We saw His Royal Highness announce the uh, Tourism Global Sustainability Center two days ago, which we are very happy to collaborate globally with, uh, multiple stakeholders. And finally, none of this will come to life without resources being attached to it. Um, today, uh, we have worked with the World Bank on the Tourism Community Initiative, where Saudi has put $100 million forward. And we look forward to further and further. But I really want to elaborate on this multilateral collaboration coming to life through this panel. This panel is a beautiful showcase for that collaboration. Yes, Saudi has set forth with the initiative to lead and redesign tourism, but again, we are humbled to be joined by such strong partners, such as this esteemed panel here today, which we are very appreciative of. Thank you, Your Royal Highness. Um, let me move to Julia. Julia, as uh, Her Royal Highness uh, mentioned, uh, redesigning tourism. Do you think that based on all those procedures, standards, protocols, uh, uh, um, uh, updated and adjusted uh, operations that we have now and that we created to navigate through this uh, very difficult time and this uh, pandemic, uh, the face of tourism, do you think um, has changed forever? And that's why we're calling to redesign the future of tourism? Well, first of all, can I thank you on behalf of the 200 CEOs and the private sector of travel and tourism for inviting us here today. Um, thank you, Your Excellencies, and also La Ministra. Um, it's a great honor to be here. And I think, actually, the answer to this question, the first step is what you've achieved here today, because you've put t tourism center stage with this amazing conference. Um, and as the Princess, her, uh, her, her Excellency explained, it does represent 10% of our global GDP. So there are investors in the hall in FII who are looking where to invest. And the other major point um, that was also so made yesterday by His Excellency is this is about human beings, human capital. 80% of our industry are small and medium businesses. Lots of these are family-run businesses that put bread on the table of people. These are real jobs. And today, um, we're looking at new figures um, that show that hopefully by the end of 2022, if we can sustain the cooperation of international authorities in terms of harmonizing travel and not putting up more barriers, we hope to be able to see the recovery of 6.6 .6 million jobs in the region, in this region, which is absolutely wonderful. But I do applaud your efforts today and what you are doing. To answer the very specifics, your I think it's completely normal when you have a big health crisis, countries look inward. They look inward, they come up with their own solutions, they're frightened. People were actually frightened. And so what's come out is this hodgepodge of different systems. Great credit to the Europeans and La Ministra with developing the EU travel pass, Great credit to Saudi Arabia that has some very, very simple systems in place. You've been able to open your home again to travelers. So we're looking for some kind of harmonization. But I'm going to be a realist. Richard Quest asked very hard questions. Well, how is that ever going to happen? Governments never collaborate. But I would say that there are already um, digital solutions and platforms. There are portals that where you could upload your different QR code from wherever you're traveling. And I think it's an opportunity 
that we leapfrog a couple of generations of innovation and technology so that we can have contactless travel. But with contactless travel means fewer people. But we need people in our industry because they are what people come to visit. So although we talk about technology, human capital, ha human capital is so critical in, a, in our sector. So, yeah, I, I, th I think we're going to do it. I think there are a lot of opportunities, and the world is opening up. So we see lots of good data coming forward. Thank you, Julia. Greg, what do you think? Um, I think I agree with everything said, except for Princess Haifa, including me in a beautiful panel. Other than that, <laughs> I, I would... How lucky think, you are I don't today. think that's ever been said before uh, of, of me. So, you know, we've spent a lot of time in, in the region and in Saudi in the last little while. I can't think of any place more fitting to have this meeting because I can't think of any, any more people. I'm so sorry for They're that. They're after the beautiful panel. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, the, the, uh, uh, I can't think of uh, any place more fitting to have this panel because uh, I can't think of any more, any set of people more committed to growing their tourism business than, than the Saudis. Both Princess Haifa, the minister, uh, Fahad at STA has been absolutely supportive of everything we, we, we've tried to do. Um, the local investment community, the same. Uh, I think you're going to find that um, there'll be projects that have nearer term goals and there are projects that have longer term goals. I think supporting those projects is going to be important both to create some early wins here in Saudi so people can be convinced that uh, progress is being made in the tourism Pe people are visited. I saw uh, the minister published his tourism goals for next year and I think it's 50 million visitors uh, here in Saudi. We're here to help you as much as we can uh, get, get those people here. And I, I think you're going to find that whether it's government cooperation that you're talking about, what people really want is certainty, right? So I think however much friction there is to get someplace, people want to know what they have to do to go and what they have to do to come back. And if we lower the standard yeah. of, of commitment from governments, just to give the travel industry that. Do I need to get PCR tested? Um, Spain has an excellent system for their PLF system where you can go online and you have an app for your, for your PLF. I, I think certainty is the first thing that the governments can, can help us with because we can get people to travel if, we, if they don't have reservations about doing so. Yeah, let me, let me discuss this more with you because I think unified international traveling standard is what everyone is calling for. Mm -hmm. But is it even doable? No. And the reason is it's the U.S.'s fault. So America can't, so America's 30 or 40 percent of the gross travelers uh, worldwide, and the U.S. can't get, forget the unified standard, they can't get an American standard. So they, they don't have a national database to register people. So, and, and some states don't have any database at all to speak of. So how, for instance, if Saudi wants to plug into the database, are they going to do that if there isn't one? Europe has an excellent system uh, for their green passes that works in, uh, I apologize for not knowing exactly how many European countries there are, but however many there are, it works across, uh, it works across Europe and it works really well. And so um, uh, I, I, think, I think you're going to find that that, that isn't going to be a near-term solution. You know, I still travel, if you remember this, uh, with my yellow vaccine card, which is a, a card that you got when, you first, when I first started traveling about 35 years ago, which kind of umbrellas out all the vaccines that you have. Um, that card was an, was, was an international standard in its day, and that card's been done away with. Just automating that card would work. Then I could tell who had a flu shot, who had a yellow fever shot, who had a COVID shot, right? It, it, it shouldn't just apply to COVID, it should apply to everything. Um, and so I don't see them doing that, mostly because America's holding them back, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Kelly, let's first of all hear from you. What do you think of what uh, we have discussed so far? Before I move to cruises, because I, I would like to know where we stand for, uh, on, in that sector. Wonderful. Well. Again, I, I offer my thanks and my gratitude and appreciation for um, the work that's taking place here. I mean, there's such yeah. an 
unbelievable opportunity to build on the lessons that have been learned by others and to really put forward a best-in-class um, product that will enlarge the map, increase the people-to-people -people connectivity that is so important um, and makes travel so powerful. And there are a lot of challenges, and I, I do agree that there are some that can be addressed in the near term, and there are some that can, will take a little bit longer. We sometimes fall in that category. But I think to Julia's point, the, you know, the ability for us to work together in public-private partnerships to solve problems that can be solved when there's input from the private sector and it leverages the expertise of operations to pull the levers of government so that you're actually leveraging off one another is a way to accelerate some of these challenges. And, you know, I think I, I strongly agree um, with uh, our hosts that you know, the, the tourism is undeniable. It is too big to fail. I think that is the most perfect headline to come from today's session um, because it does affect everyone. And so to be taken seriously, to be viewed in some of the ministries like the economic and the finance ministries is an important way to situate governments so that when there is an outlet for the private sector to contribute, we can go faster when there is that kind of dialogue that happens between the two. So, so tell me, where do we stand with the cruises? Are you being able to get people back on the ships yet, or do you have bookings? Which, which leads me to, um, I too have to offer our thanks to the Europeans. It was through the EU Healthy Gateways project that cruising was able to start uh, resuming operations in the summer of 2020 because there was dialogue between the public and the private sector. And cruises were able to start operating in Asia and in Europe using some of the most stringent protocols, which was pre-vaccine, with guests enjoying their time with a lower incidence rate on cruise ships than you could experience on land, and then came vaccines. And it really was that dialogue um, between the public and the private sector that started it, and the U.S. is one of the last to the table, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that cruising has resumed in the largest market, North America, as of the end of this June, and we should be back to 80%, but there still are some markets that are closed. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there are these exciting opportunities like we see in this region where, you know, the cruise industry likes to think that they're leaders in responsible tourism. And so the opportunity to work together in partnership to really protect sensitive um, marine lands and coastal communities and to be able to deliver a wide range of products so that there really is an opportunity um, for international guests, for domestic guests, is what's exciting about the future of cruise and the future of cruise in this region. Tell me, uh, how is the procedure you have uh, in place now, uh, the protocol that you follow? Uh, it's not easy. It is, it's a completely different word we're talking about here. Right. Well, uh, for most, so the cruise industry, compared to some of my counterparts here, is relatively small. And so we do have the ability for many of the cruise operators to be requiring their guests and their crew to be vaccinated. And so in many instances, you'll see 100% vaccination, which limits okay. the guests, because clearly children are not in a position, which is a challenge mm -hmm. for an industry for us to have vaccination as a requirement. But you'll see cruising now, the majority of these ships have all of their crew vaccinated, the guests majority vaccinated, and a significant amount of testing. So testing before you arrive, testing while you're on the ship, and testing really has been central to our protocol since the earliest days. In fact, we were the first industry to require 100% testing of passengers and crew before they boarded. And you know, given how dynamic the, the virus is, these protocols are continually evolving and adapting. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of a cruise ship is many of them have state-of-the-art medical facilities. So some of the lessons that we've learned, and I think we'll get to it, is just how important it is to communicate with local authorities at all levels, but to be able to have plans in place to, to deal with the unexpected. So it's a combination of 
what happens before you leave home, what happens while you're on the ship, and then what is your coordination, what is your, your strategy um, when you have to leave the ship. So can we book? So you can so book. Can you can book, you can cruise. Is it safe to go? <laughs> it is. It, I've you been know. wanting to do that for so many years, and I never had the chance to, and look at this now. Right, well, I'll tell you, uh, with our members that are in the audience, they will tell you it's the, probably one of the safest ways to travel now. Really? With the most uh, stringent protocols that you'll find of I hear that from, from also airline CEOs. They all, they all the same, say the same thing. Except for I don't think that any airline has a 100% vaccination requirement, do they? United does. Um, for their the, staff. Yeah, for their staff. Yeah. I don't think for their travelers, no. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's so come, cruise. Uh, well, I can I testify promise. to that safety. Yeah. I, I went cruising post-pandemic. I can testify to the safety. Okay, yes. cool. See? <laughs> Brave of you. <laughs> you let me know how it goes. <laughs> okay, let's move back to your excellency. Spain is very important in the um, world ecosystem of tourism. Um, what tangible actions are being taken by your government to ensure that tourism's contribution in Spain to the global recovery of the sector is maximized. Bueno, como, como bien dices, eh, España es eh, uno de los líderes en, en el ámbito turístico. Eh, Spain eh, is known as one of the advanced countries in the field of tourism, and what we should uh, work further in order to improve the services that we provide through our uh, stakeholders because tourism is a primary industry for our, our country and it's something that we are working on developing uh, in Spain. Uh, through uh, the works of uh, the Ministry of Tourism and through such events like this we are participating in now, we are trying to, to showcase the participation or the contribution of the pr uh, private sector to the works and efforts of the public sector. And through panels like this panel, we show that we cannot work separately, we cannot work in isolation. We need to work together, to coordinate together. And I like to advise that we need to have some kind of governance in order to be able to de take decisions uh, a unified decision and standardized decisions because uh, we, uh, according to our experience in the field of tourism industry in Spain, we progressed a lot because we faced a lot of difficult times before and we were able to overcome these difficulties by such measures. And I would like to thank the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for allowing us the opportunity and for working and planning for tourism in the world in general, and we will ne we, we need to be uh, to prove that we can work in a better way on the international level, and indeed uh, the corona, the COVID-19 negatively impacted the private sector and many companies, but many companies could uh, afford the shock. So we need more cooperation between the governments and the businesses on different levels because people uh, are missing travel because of the COVID-19. And we need to work all as one hand in order to be able to improve our services and to improve our work our industry in order to be able to achieve the progress that we all want to achieve. We need uh, integration and cooperation between a public and private sectors. We need to focus on uh, the points or rooms of improvement. We need to work on them to positively bridge the gaps that are currently available. We need also to change the principles some of the old principles and to start hiring uh, our human capabilities to retrieve our talents back. So I'd say that this panel is very important to set the general rules for tourism in the future. We are trying our best to start specific programs through which we will be able to develop the uh, tourism sector and His Excellency, the Minister of uh, Tourism, I agree with what 
He said that we can work together and it is the best way to move forward. In order to take the initiative, the private sector will take the initiative, the public sector will provide the policies that will enable the work in order to push tourism forward and to provide some kind of a recipe, this recipe for work, the recipe in order to treat our current situation, to learn and to move forward for the future. You've mentioned that you worked as an investment banker. And uh, it's, it's very important uh, as part of any recovery for any sector is investment. How can we encourage investment here? What should be, what should be done not only by the government, but also the private sector and, and companies? And even we can talk about capital markets as well. I think um, investment is critical, especially as we are now putting this pandemic behind us and moving forward. We should see opportunity in everything. Um, as Julia mentioned, SMEs represent 80% of our industry globally. So we shouldn't, in looking at investments, we shouldn't neglect those who need support the most. So speaking from government perspective, we need to ensure that there are the right policies, regulations in place, but also the right investment opportunities are highlighted in order to encourage these small and medium enterprises and business and direct them into uh, the right spaces. Investment doesn't just come from private sector as well. It should come from clear guidance from government. It should come from multilateral cooperation. Yesterday, um, there was a conversation about um, usually investors in tourism. What is tourism? Tourism is bringing people from outside to come and visit a country, uh, get introduced to a new culture, have a new experience. It's bridging the gap beti between cultures. And today, the same can be said for investment. So today, investors want to expand their horizons into experiences. So not necessarily being destination driven, but also uh, being uh, across the entire value chain of an entire experience. So we don't just need to look at how we facilitate for them in, in a specific country, but we need to look at how we work together and how we use international organizations and hear from them on whatever the issues that are faced with private sector in order to see how we can best support them. Today, we cannot deny that a pandemic has taken place and has left the sector not the same way it was, and we need to work quickly to support private sector in that recovery, but definitely to look at innovation today and how that can take part in really leapfrogging where we could be and what we could do and where we could go and walk that journey with private sector and not just point the finger and say, this is needed and, and, and watch them go and do, but to actually take that journey with 100%. them. Julia, what do you think? Well, I completely agree. Um, and. I think the princess is spot on. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for investors. I mean, Greg may have a view on that. I think there's also a lot of uh, opportunities for investors around the green agenda. And it's certainly something as we emerge from this pandemic, I think the travel and tourism sector is going to be showing leadership in this field. Um, so, you know, I, I do completely agree. The one point I would add is we've been working very closely with COVAX. I'm sure lots of us yes. have, uh, because there is some, some people are saying it could take up to five years to vaccinate the whole world. And if we're going to truly have a global um, opportunity uh, for travel, we need to be able to speed that up. So the private sector is certainly rolling up its sleeves with governments to try and ensure that we have some kind of vaccine equity. And also the point Kelly made about children. Although we do encourage people to be double vaxxed, there will always be some people in our community for whatever reason cannot be fully vaccinated. And we need to have quite simple protocols in place to be able to embrace them. And so if you are doing a cruise, as you're saying, or you're going to a destination and you've got, you know, a grandparent, parents, children, in that mix somewhere, there's always going to be somebody that has some issues around vaccination. So we need to get the testing much slicker. And I would also slightly controversially say that some of the uh, businesses around PCR testing, I'm calling it the Wild West, 
We've seen some extraordinary price gouging going on. You know, they've seen the opportunity. Um, but, you know, if you've got a family of four that want to go on holiday and that some places that are requiring PCR testing, you know, you could be adding $800 or more to that family holiday. It's not, it's not feasible. So that is another area where I think the private sector needs to work in collaboration with the princess, with governments, with this government, to ensure there are some kind of controls. Here I am speaking from the private sector, looking <laughs> asking for regulation. But I do think in that area, there needs to be a little bit of control. Yes. Um, and it's also, as Greg said, about keeping it simple. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, I like the mix we have here and, and all those views uh, we're hearing. Greg, let me uh, talk to you about investment uh, in the uh, tourism space now. How many calls do you get a day? Um, I'd say at the beginning of the pandemic, we were getting three to five a week. That probably hit a peak of about 10 a day mm -hmm. um, for different, uh, from different people, CEOs of businesses that needed working capital. You know, <clears throat> this probably isn't the time for it, but each one of these businesses needs help in a different way. Um, there are a lot of successful businesses that have big summer seasons in Spain and Greece and Italy uh, who didn't have as big a summer season as they had planned to this summer or last summer, and now they don't have the working capital to make it through the winter. Business is fine. They just don't have enough cash uh, because they, they're, they're see, working capital um, is pretty seasonal and it swings. So now they don't have enough money to make deposits. It's a pretty easy problem to fix. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people are demanding different things from us in the next little while. We got a great idea from the minister and, and, and Fahad and, and Princess Saif when we were here um, in 20, I can't remember, it was this summer or last summer, I could, it all blends together. But they had talked about the electrification of Saudi Arabia and and uh, and how the vision for that electrification was important to the future of their country. Uh, we actually took that idea, we had a lot of talks with uh, um, the people here, but we took that idea and ended up spending, you might have seen this in the paper, $4.2 billion to buy 100,000 Teslas, uh, because now we have the cars. Like, uh, Princess Haifa can, can want to electrify Riyadh or Jeddah all she wants, but if she can't buy the 10,000 electric cars because there's no supply, then there's, there, there won't be any supply. Um, uh, you know, we're getting, we're getting ready for these electric cars being driven autonomously, right? So having experience managing the electric cars in a fleet and doing all those things matter. So I think you're going to see different themes. I think Saudi Arabia, we, we, vi we visited this place called I'll, I'll probably slaughter the pronunciation, so if I do, Princess Saifa, please help me out. Uh, Suda, in, 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 and, and it is absolutely fantastic, right? It's in the hills. It, it would be hard pressed to think you weren't, you might not be in the south of France when, 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 when you're there. Um, we visited Alula, which, uh, which I, I would tell you, if it's not the top, it's probably in the top three tourist destinations that I've ever been to. Wow. And, and, and very few people know about it. And so we've been working with, so for true. instance, the tourism ministry. I think the minister's tired of me talking about Alula, by the way. But um, the, 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 uh, so for instance, Dubai will get 20 to 25 million visitors over the next little while. We think every one of those should visit Alula. Right um, while they're here, as a first experience into Saudi Arabia, at least for the intrepid traveler, uh, I don't, I don't think you can. Don't worry, Princess Saifa, we're not sending 25 million people to Alula any anytime soon. So uh, th that would overwhelm the hotel capacity you have. We're welcome. We're welcoming <laughs> everyone. We'll find solutions. You'll have to put up a giant tent city in Alula. We're, we're problem solvers. <laughs> we'll right. do it the Bedouin way. We'll have tents. <laughs> there you go. So I think there's going to be a lot of really good opportunities to invest here. I think wellness as a theme is going to play really well. I think ESG as a theme, and we were talking about this before when we were sitting in the green room. I think it's also important to remind everybody in the room as investors and as operators and as government agencies, don't hold out these travel companies to be perfect on ESG. Just ask them to be better every year. So if you were, if you were at one level in 2019, you should be better in 2020, you should be better in 2021. Because if perfect is the ideal, people will just give up on that goal, right? You know, we're not gonna convert all the airlines in the world to hydrogen and not burn any carbon next year, right? Maybe 
in a long time from now, you'll have electric aircraft and you'll have hydrogen-powered aircraft, but in the, in the short term, we just need to have them use more green fuel, right? Um, maybe fly shorter distances in some cases, uh, be able to have, the, have people purchase carbon offset credits when they fly. There's all kinds of things that we can do to, to make things friendly. Sorry, I took up a lot of time there. I, I, I apologize. That, no, we, that we've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Your Royal Highness, any closing remarks from your side? I think, again, tourism is all about people. And uh, in Saudi Arabia, we invite you all to come and visit the Saudi people. I want to really thank this amazing panel because they have showcased the theme of, of this, which is redesigning the future of tourism by being here, showcasing private sector, government sitting together, having the conversation together, focusing on the key element, which is humanity, the theme of the FII. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I would ask our audience to remain seated because we will be doing the okay. next session in less than five minutes. Thank you for our uh, distinguished panelists. So our next session, uh, we will focus on investing in tomorrow, meeting the needs of the future. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, I would like to introduce, to, to introduce our distinguished panelists, Barry Sterlitz. Excellent. Oh, I hope I, <laughs> I pronounced it right, co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Starwood Capital Group, Rich Agrawal. CEO of OYO, you're the founder as well, right? Of OYO Rooms, Sebastian Bazin, CEO of Accor, and Fahad Hamdadin, the CEO of STA. They've, they've tested me big time with the names today. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, for making the time, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, Fahad, let me start with you. Okay. You've, you've attended the uh, first two panels. We've discussed so many uh, things uh, with the, the government side, with the private sector, um, even from regulators. What do you think, where do we stand now in, 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 in terms of tourism, aviation, hospitality? Uh, are we really on the way to recover? Or this is really just being very optimistic? Although we're not very good on gender mix here I versus know. the previous panel, <laughs> but we are definitely having the right people to vet what the previous panels were saying. Mm. I think the time is to stop talking and start and, walking. Yes. Nature has given us 18 months to, uh, to think mm -hmm. and talk. Now it's time for us to walk. And the gentlemen behind, I mean, on my right and left, are the, was, are the ones to attest to whether governments are walking the talk or not. My job is to meet businesses and ensure the destination is growing with those that are ready and have you know, the right commitments to, to generate the, the growth that we all look for. And the growth we look for is a growth that is um, you know, um, driven by all the principles and the lessons we've learned. In the first panel, actually, I was listening, it closed by saying, the worst has passed. I would say, the worst it has not if we, if we go back to where we were. So there are things we need to change, and we need to change in delivery. So that's probably what I would say. What delivery we should change? What should be done differently uh, in your view? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. It's a pretty open question. Yeah. You know, the pandemic changed everyone's behavior, both yeah. um, in their lives. And Is there any way to go back, you think, or 
uh, what no, we I, have I, now is, is here to stay. You, you've changed, the consumers learned a lot of new habits. My, my mother can buy on Amazon, she's 87. She didn't know how to turn on her computer, right? She can book a room on her phone in a hotel. And I think uh, the whole world learned to use mobile devices. Yep. We learned how to serve food without a waiter. We, you click on a menu. Some of this is actually a better service proposition. It's better for the consumer. And we'll keep going with this. It's actually better business, too. It's lower cost for us. And there's less mistakes. You, the order is correct because you ordered it and go straight to the kitchen. So I don't think we'll go back to when we shouldn't go back to the prehistoric, pre-pandemic service mod, uh, methods. On the other hand, it opened up a whole new category of ways to connect to the customer and technology is racing ahead and allowing us to personalize the experiences in a way we never could before. And people are there to catch. Usually technology is so far ahead of the customer that they, they're slow to adopt. And certainly people of my generation, we were, well, I, I can use my iPhone, but my mother couldn't. So, you know, everyone has learned how to, how to participate now in the digital world. And our job is to create content and experiences for them that they can't replicate on their phone or in their, what will come in augmented reality and virtual reality. And I tend to think people like people. And, and I think because the world has lost community, really, especially with the demise of organized religion in the Western world, you know, the, the, the community is going to come and what we create for them in their destinations. And so I think it's, it's raised the bar. And if you succeed, you're going to do much better than everyone else. So it will be fascinating to see what happens over the coming decade. Looking forward, honestly. Um, let me, um, uh, Sebastian, ask you here how the approach of uh, hospitality CEOs and CEOs of this industry in general should ab approach the changes that have been made to the industry so they can build the industry of the future, of tomorrow. If I knew I'd be a king, I, no, seriously, I know what I was, I was thinking, Barry, because I, I've been trying to follow his path for the last 20 years. 20? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 clearly, no, 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 no. And on what, what he created with Starwood Hotels and all the lifestyle, he created it. And now I was looking at you, Barry, I don't know how you do this. I'm trying to do this. <laughs> Gosh, it hurts. No, it doesn't hurt you. Uh, uh, he he works out. No, seriously. You, you need to hit the gym more yeah. often. Well, the world, it's uh, two or three things. Number one, don't ever think the hospitality industry is dying. It's oh. exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating, great growth industry at scale with a lot of money behind it, a lot of demand, and a supply which is today and has been for the last 40 years, half the level of demand. So it's very rare to have a trillion dollars industry, 70 trillion, where you know demand exceeds supply by twice. And that will be the case for the next 40 years. The one thing that I guess you have to agree and admit, that the clients of tomorrow are likely to be different in terms of what they expect from you, in terms of mixed, in terms of destinations, in terms of wherewithal, in terms of emitting market, vastly different. So we as hospitality CEOs, one, we have to have a proper diagnostic. How are they different? Can I cope with those differences? Can I respond to what they want? And at the same time, can I still differentiate myself? So I like the days of today because those who are going to be thinking rightly will make a difference. So anybody who has been boring and inventing and duplicating a brand as we have done. Myriad, Hilton, Aco, I can blame myself. Those commodity product brands are not going to be dying, but they no longer be growing in developed countries. In emerging countries, they will, because there's a lack of infrastructure. So sub-Saharan Africa and many other continents like we've done in South America, don't you worry, you're going to have a lot of Novotel and a lot of Hilton. But on the Western world, and in this country particularly, the clients of tomorrow is going to be highly demanding. They're going to want better fulfillment. They want isolated places. They want to be recognized. They want to discover somebody else's culture. They want to liaise with human interaction. They want to discover architecture, food. So you're going to have to embrace them. You're going to have to basically stay with them for probably a longer stay 
as opposed to five days, probably seven days, because they're going to travel less, but they're going to stay more. So it's going to be a fascinating time where finally, what I was looking forward, human capital will make the difference. Mm -hmm. Forget technology. We all talk about technology. I love it. Fine, don't be against it. But when you are in a hotel business, what matters the most is that person in front of you smiling to you and bringing you something that you were looking forward to get. And when they're going to come back home, they're going to be talking about the smile, the language they have learned, the food they've experienced, and they will never talk whether they've been going through booking and even what was the price of the hotel room. So the days of tomorrow is the days for professional, not for amateurs. So you really agree with the Her Royal Highness Princess Haifa saying tourism is, is too big to fail. She is so right. But it is a very intensive business because we all know when you work in a hotel, there's two things we have learned through the pandemic. Number one, and you're right, we had time to think. And I spent a lot of time alone in my office to think. And it was tough. But what I've learned is the tens of thousands of people of our court that I did not know whether they were in Chile or in Sri Lanka or in San Paolo, God knows, they have been creative, audacious, accessible, generous, kind. Give them the keys, for God's sake. They know better. They understand the local community. Don't ever continue to decide anything centric. Give it to them. They actually deserve it. Thank you. Ritish, I hope I'm pronouncing your name, it's name right. It's perfect. It's perfect. Good. So you came up with this crazy idea. You started this company. Did the pandemic work in your favor? Well, you know, uh, to begin with, three of my co-panelists have explained about um, how travel is, um, you know, uh, to Princess, uh, Her Highness Princess Haifa's, Haifa's words, too big to fail. Mm. I believe that a lot of times, often I get this question of saying that, will travel exist at all in the future? And I think I want to reiterate what my fellow co-panelists have mentioned, which is, I think travel is here to stay. And the easiest way to look at it is this conference happening in a period where pandemic is not gone fully, has 5,000 plus people coming here from all different parts of the world. And I can tell you this, that every year there'll be more people going forward. So it's pretty straightforward to imagine that um, travel is here to stay. But that said, I think I agree with Sebastian in his perspective of saying that while travel will not just be similar to what it was earlier, it may actually grow every year in times to come, it will not be exactly the same as it was in the past. It uh, will structurally change. How do you picture it now? You know, I think it's very hard to crystal ball gaze today because the world's changing so rapidly, right? But there are a few things that we see in our company, and I can uh, use those as context, and I'm sure uh, Sebastian um, uh, and, and others are also seeing similar things. One of the things that we see is people appreciate domestic markets a lot more than international. So for the first time, and even here in the kingdom, I see people talking about Taif a lot more, even for people who were in Jeddah for the first time than ever earlier. And similarly, in different parts of the world, we see domestic being a big source of demand. For example, our holiday home demand. We used to always see Germans come into Denmark, and Danes used to travel to other parts of Europe. Last year, we saw almost 90% of the bookings being Danes traveling in Denmark itself. Mm -hmm. The second thing I see is flexibility, similar to what Sebastian was saying, that I think um, on one side people need an isolated experience, which is vacation homes and hotels with uh, villas will see substantial amount of demand. But combined with that, people want flexibility because plans are changing all the time, uh, especially in this new world, restrictions may come in all, at, at all times. So I see that people are booking a lot more last minute. Last fiscal, we got almost 70% of our customers booked us on the same day of check-in even in holiday destinations. So people really are moving to on-demand in the world of travel like never before. I think another thing that I also see, which is a fascinating trend, is this ramp of holiday homes. Mm. I see that, of course, hotels continue to be, and you know, we have a very large uh, business where we uh, enable hotel reservations. But at the same time, we're seeing holiday homes becoming a very popular alternative for customers because of isolation, as uh, Sebastian was explaining earlier. I, th I think I can go on, but there's just one last thing I'd share, is that organized ecosystem is rapidly taking share from unorganized ecosystem in different ways, right? I think, for example, in the Western world, as Sebastian mentioned, consumers are becoming more demanding and they want unique experiences like never before and lifestyle, as we were talking earlier. We, I see that growing substantially in times to come. 
I see um, in the uh, underpenetrated markets, unbranded eco ecosystems becoming branded. But essentially, I feel that consumers will care more about service. Consumers will care more about that smile uh, at the lobby. And for that, if they need to pay a little bit extra, I think that, that will, uh, consumers will be OK to do that in time. Can I, can I Please. say something? I, I'm going to say that the first two are transient. People stayed in their countries because they had to. They were afraid to leave their country. I, I think international travel will explode, just as we all had our resorts in the United States went crazy during the pandemic. People had money, and I, I, my, my home is now Miami, Florida, and our hotels, the whole, every hotel was completely full at twice the rates they were in 2019 because people wanted to get away. And, and I believe as international flights will open, people will travel again because people love traveling. And, people, and, and the rise of the Chinese, the rise of India, the growth of this industry is going to be astronomical. And it won't go away with technology. Technology will just enable it. But people like travel. And they like seeing all other cultures. And it's, it, everybody wants to go to Paris. And everybody wants to come see Rome and the Colosseum. So, I think the first two were really a function of the, the holiday home, the isolation. I don't believe that's long term either. I do think the authenticity of the experience, the, it, I started this brand called One Hotels and we do luxury green. And I wasn't sure when I opened next to the Edition and the Faena and the Ritz Carlton and that we could, with a central office of 15 people, that we could book our hotel. We rose to number one on TripAdvisor out of 220 hotels in Miami and the highest market share, 170% of fair market against chains because we had an authentic experience that people could research online and they made their own decisions. And I think, sadly, for the, for the bulk of the old companies in the industry, they're dinosaurs. They don't, there's no emotive content to a Marriott. And I used to run Starwood Hotels. I, I own Sheridan. I own Weston. I created St. Regis as a brand. I started W Hotels. They're in trouble. The new, the new competition is guys that have authenticity, and it's end to end. It's when you check in or you get your reservation to when you go home. And we're not just about a stay. We're about what do we stand for, and then, then we can price against it. So you know, I love competing against the, my old company. I, and I, I'm shocked. I'm actually shocked that all the ones that have been built are the number one markets, hotels in their market against established players. I'm shocked, but there's enough consumers that care and then it's not price sensitive either. Right now, the world is awash in cash, and the consumer in the United States is sitting on $2 trillion. Mm. So you're getting rates that I can't believe. This doesn't look like a pandemic in the sense of pricing, pricing uh, power. You can, you can, if you have a hotel, our hotel in New York City, there's nobody in the office. The one central park is running 80% occupancy. Brooklyn's at 85. And so all domestic travel, and, you know, and the Four Seasons down the road is closed. So it's an interesting time. It's very, it's fascinating for entrepreneurs and for people who, who are creative. It's never been a better time. Absolutely. It's not a cookie cutter time going forward. I don't yeah. think so. Well, you can have a cookie cutter of a great experience, by the way, and he's doing that with his lifestyle brands. I was telling him I, I was pissed off at him. <laughs> so he's, uh, he's going to make so it I'm hard not, for, I'm not harder dying, for me. I'm not dying now. You're no, you're my be friend. Slow you're my friend. You're my friend. <laughs> but he's, he's bought a lot of lifestyle brands because I think he saw the future. And he decided that was where his growth was, was not commodity product. And mm -hmm. it used to be just a safe, clean room. Hospitality is not hotels anymore. We have Airbnb, we have Oyo, Oyo. and all of their vacation home rentals. We have to think about, we compete against, we have to produce an experience. Because in New York City, there's more Airbnb rooms now than hotel rooms. So like, you're competing against that too. So why would you stay in my big hotel? Only if I offer you something unique you can't get in that house, which is frankly a better value than my hotel room. So I got to have a gym, I got the spa, I have to wellness, my food has to be good. I have to order a complete, provide a package that lures you and makes you come to me all the time when you come to the city. So it's a really interesting time. I kind of think it's fun. It is, absolutely. Um, uh, Fahd, um, you, you know, like um, the, the point of the 85% uh, occupancy rate uh, now is uh, fascinating, right? Uh, it's crazy. Fahad, uh, back to the government. Uh, how can governments leverage uh, those key ch uh, changes uh, to create new destinations, as we mentioned, and fuel development for economic uh, uh, growth? So let me anchor on what Barry said. Yeah. So those that are skeptics about travel coming back or not, he's saying it's only growing. If I can quote Expedia latest report saying that the Generation Y 
versus baby boomers in terms of growth of travel has doubled. And you see the trend, the delta is only increasing. So people are simply going to travel more, and, we, and this is going to come back. He also and we, said, we will have the, the different trends, as he mentioned. Yeah, yeah, but, it's going to be seasonal. Yeah, but then travel is, has, you know, has witnessed... Again, I'm new to this, thanks to these. I'm, I'm only humble to be uh, between the two gentlemen here. But um, what we've studied when we looked at our destination, Saudi, we looked at where trends are going. But it started three, de three decades ago. People were choosing to where to travel based on nature. And then it moved to culture. So if you take France, nearly 40% of travelers to France used to go to the south of France. And now Paris alone captures 90% of travelers to France. Um, uh, sorry, to, to Paris. Now, it's simply culture. Culture, as in shows, F&B, um, food and, and shows and entertainment, museums and so on. The latest has a shift from culture to lifestyle. And lifestyle is a subset of culture that is basically defined by the like-minded and the like-hearted people. So those passionate travelers are seeking the cool brands, the authentic brands, and those, that, those brands that can actually give them the human connection and the ability to achieve their goals, whether they are foodies, yogis, whatever they are, environmentalists, those are the, the, those, they identify themselves by the like-minded and the like-hearted. And no matter where I am from, being Saudi or not, if I am a K-pop fan, I'm going to look for the K-pop fan um, in Paris or in Dubai or any other city. Exactly. So how can we understand these passionate, lifestyle-driven travelers and make sure we're authentic? As far as Saudi is concerned, authenticity is the number one base we start with. In order not to become a dinosaur that can't come back, as Barry said, we're starting young and we're trying to stay nimble to make sure that we learn from the, from the world and we have a greenfield advantage. So whether it's Deraya, the 300 years old uh, center capital of, uh, of, and the birthplace of the Saudi monarchy in Riyadh, where they're building the largest mud city. We are starting to build the largest mud city in the world. So rather than trying to cut through technology, no. Let technology serve developing the most authentic. And the same thing with al ula and same thing with um, authenticity across the board. But if I am to say, and, and going back to Sebastian's point, what do people remember when they come back from destinations? We've studied this scientifically. The number one thing people remember from destinations they go to are the human connections they had. And those journeys that give them moments of wonder where they are emotionally intrigued and intellectually stimulating, where they look back and say, now I see life in a new light, whether I'm a passionate or environmentalist, whatever I am. So I think we need to stay authentic and we need to put our human capital to the forefront and make sure that technology is enabling that rather than stripping that away. And finally, I would say we've heard sustainability. It's nice talk but it's really got to be a, the, the, the walk. We're trying to do our part in our projects and setting global coalition to make sure that we're at the center of the thinking and we're trying to s disseminate that into, uh, into practice. I will come back to the sustainability. Can, can I uh, jump on, on? Yes, please. No, no, Farouk, this. It's a great luxury for Saudi Arabia to start from a greenfield vision. You, I'm saying it not because I'm in Saudi here but I've been here for the last five years, every time. It's, you have something which is extraordinary in this country. You have a vast territory with wonders of the world that people don't know of now. You have a vision, a plan, financial resources, and a lot of good professionals, whether they are Saudi or non-Saudi, they know how to execute. And then you have people like us come in because they want to play part of the adventure. If I had to do it again with Accor, I wish I would have the luxury of not carrying on. Accor is a fascinating company, but I'm moving slow because I have to respect 50 years of history and 300,000 people. But when you talk about I just want to say very quickly, because we just have to accept the world of tomorrow. 
I know we all talk about lifestyle because lifestyle is quirky, sexy, funky, and it amuses everybody. But this is not a gimmick. Lifestyle is two recipe to meet your customer's demand and your owner's expectation. One, the person, the personnel working in a lifestyle environment, they resemble the guest. Many of them have no hospitality experience. They could have tattoos, they could be having a beer, they just, they don't know really how to handle themselves, but they're kind, they're nice, and they want to help, and they are present. And it has a lot to do with those present. And the second thing, which we need to talk about, because that's a recipe of tomorrow, and you're gonna get it happen in Saudi. A lifestyle hotel has nothing to do with the design, the color, the space, nothing. It's 50% of the revenues of that site comes from the local community. And those per person coming will never even see the rooms because they don't need a bed or shower because they live next door. But they're coming because it is a social club, social hub, because they want to meet the travelers, because they want to meet around themselves, and because you basically provide something that they're looking forward to get. If you can basically coincide and put together the travelers, and the travelers will come because it is a trendy place, because it basically appeals to the local community. So we have to reverse entirely our thinking. For 50 years, we only thought about that person coming from far. All of a sudden, we have to reshift 360 degrees, thinking, let me do it for local community, which is what you talked about, Fad. I've been saying for our core, developing land which is underdeveloped against the local community, ACO will never ever do this again. We should not. Uh, so start from the local, do, for, do exactly what they want to get from you. Don't you worry, the travelers will come because that place is the place to be. But not easy to do at scale. And, and, and very, very, very hard to do at scale. It's very hard to do at scale. So, it's, so when I entered the hotel industry, I, I tried to separate our brands by design. So Weston had a look, Sheridan had a look, St. Regis had a look, W was the flagship of innovation for us. It was our laboratory. And I got to sit in there because I didn't have all these owners doing their own thing, which in a lot of times in the hotel companies, there's a third party fleet. It's not owned by you. They're just the manager. So you have to convince the flag, the owner, to actually spend money on something, and they're like, I don't want to do that, or I'll be the last guy to do that. You show it works in the rest of the fleet. So the consumer doesn't get a consistent experience. Now with technology, you have a new way to compete. You can compete on an on a affinity group. So I want a quiet hotel. Mm. I want to go on vacation, I want a quiet hotel. I have a quiet hotel, I don't want a discotheque. I want a, I want a discotheque, I want a rage, I want to have a fun time. Those are totally different markets. And the, the fleet of hotels and experiences will start to segment two affinity groups and break apart, it will fractionalize. Because we've done to the hotel industry what Chrysler did to the car industry. They, it was the K car. They tried to do everything for everyone. So I'll have the restaurant, in, in traditional hotels, the restaurant serves fish and meat and chicken. And maybe there's a Thai dish and a chicken. Nobody eats like that. When you say to your loved one, where are we going to go tonight? You say, do you want French? Do you want Italian? Do you want Thai? Do you want Chinese? But hotels were like, they, the restaurants, they have a little bit of everything. And so what happened is you go to the hotel, you eat there maybe one night, and then you go out to a local restaurant because you don't, there's, so you bring in third party guys who are really good at restaurants, and you let them run the restaurant, and it becomes a local hangout, and that's how it, and then you get, you open your spa, because your spa now can serve the community, not just, you know, the, the hotels, and then it, you get the better, better therapists because they're, they're serving more people, and they're, they're busier, so the, the technology is going to change so much because you can talk to these people and you, and you know who they are. So, you, and they become loyal. When we bought, when I bought ITT, which owned the St. Regis in New York, there was one, we did a study of the customer base. So you were advertising all over planet Earth. 1,000 people were 70% of the revenue of the hotel. I was wasting money all over the planet to advertise the, the, the St. Regis, when I should be talking to my small group, which I can do with technology. And I never could do this before. So the world is like, we're in the infancy of this, but it's going to get, it's going to be fun and exciting and it'll be a better travel experience, I think, at the end. Thank you very much. Sebastian, back to you. Uh, which uh, sector in Accor's uh, portfolio will come out stronger, you think? You, you've it, mentioned lifestyle hotels, which no, is... But li I talk too much about lifestyle, seriously. <laughs> and I love it because I'm passionate, because I thought that's a place to be five years ago, and I happen to be maybe right today. Look at his wrist. So, He's a lifestyle guy. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, you, my, you have two watches. What do you mean? I, I just thought watch is a whoop. <laughs> An aura, a whoop, and a watch. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, no, it's, it depends so much on geography. Don't an IBIS hotel, and we have 3,000 IBIS, which is affordable, select service, yeah. we call it economy, they cater so well to the emerging markets where, because they are extremely new to, de to develop small, medium-sized enterprises. So it depends where you are. I, it's, the only thing that you have to agree is make it clear in your mind that running a Raffles Hotel, which we have, has nothing to do with running a Hoxton and very little to do with running an IBIS. So the difficulty for me is making sure that I guess the decision for one brand is made by a brand owner and not by too many chefs in the same kitchen. That's my biggest dilemma. It's just, which is why I said the pandemic have taught me I should actually get myself away from a lot of decisions. One, they don't need me. Two, I'm going to be probably more times wrong than the guy who is less credentialed than me. It just feels better to the local community and what's needed. So, no, all segments are good. Can you do it under the same hat? That's probably a larger question. Uh, what would you say the most important lesson that you've learned from the pandemic? Humbleness. I, I thought I knew everything. No, that's not true. I never thought I knew everything. Uh, yeah, it's just accept that you don't know much, that you have, however, to reconvert your people, that I had to lay off 280,000 people in one week, which was unfair, very tough. Many of them could not get paid the week after, and I made that decision. No, humbleness and... Probably, and Barry and I, we came from the same private equity world. I, I'm so happy I left the private equity world. I mean, it's, uh, I, I change side. You, when you really, the level of my decisions today has impact on 300,000 people, I'd better reflect 10 times before making a decision. Before, my decision in private equity or investment banking only had the financial consequences. That is fine. Mm -hmm. The impact is uh, far less cumbersome. Barry, what's the main takeaway? From the pandemic? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, that ze <laughs> I have zero revenues were not on the pro forma, <laughs> and that we, lose, we lost a lot of money even being closed because we had to pay real estate taxes. And we did try to pay health care for our workers uh, through for almost 18 months. And, and uh, I, 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 I th again, I, I think um, the resiliency of the people, I was impressed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, our people, they, under, they understood what was happening. And we, you know, as a corporate, we didn't fire many people, but we took a pay cut. And, uh, and I felt terrible about it, actually, of course. And, and then as the business is bouncing back, you know, we'll make up for it. But we, it, it is, it's such an important industry. It's such a great place to be. Mm. Teaching people understanding by understanding different cultures, I, it's just the best business, you know, and, and it also, we take people from the street and employ them. We can teach them skills easily. You know, in, in the States, Merritt made a career out of welfare to work. They took people off the welfare programs and put them to work, maybe as a housekeeper, maybe as a dishwasher, and they move up. And there aren't many industries that can catch this many people. And, you know, because in the, in the world of technology, we're going the other way. You know, they don't employ that many people. So the, the growth of this industry is critical. And here in Saudi, with young population, you know, there's a unique opportunity. And put them in the fun jobs, the forward-facing jobs, people-facing jobs, because technology, like Ratisha's, he showed me his technology this morning, and I was, my jaw was on the ground. So, and I'm a little <laughs> investor in him, so I was really happy. But, but he's going to take away a lot of the things that our guys waste Talking time about doing. resiliency, that guy is very... He, That's went, he went up, down, now back up. Yeah. That's, that's all great entrepreneurs have that skill set because yeah. the road is never straight up. But he, he bounced back and he's stronger for it. So I think, you know, I think it's, it's really interesting. I think um, the travel, I have, I have huge faith in the travel industry. I, I really, I mean, I, I love travel. I, I was going crazy. So I could go to, I went to Tulum a couple of times because it was far, <laughs> it, they were open. But, you know, and then as soon as I could go to Europe, I went to Europe. I, I, I like I love people, that's why I went into the business. And I had 120,000 people, I didn't have 300,000 people, so I know exactly though what he's talking about. And it's like you're, you're, you're 
you're helping people on such a grand scale, but the impact of those people having satisfied and guess on the millions of people that he, that he helps. And, and, and our job is to make their travel a little bit more fun and exciting and, and, and match, actually, but exceed their expectations. So it's, it's great. I mean, it's a great challenge, and it changes every day. True. Every day there's a new situation, right? True. A new problem. And it's really our job is to, is to help our teams, mm. give them the tools to delight the guests, and, and, yeah. and a lot of stuff that was hard to do is going to be easy to do. Like I was actually checked into, I forgot, a hotel, and I'd been there six times, and I said, they said, welcome to the whatever, and I said, I've been here six times, <laughs> and they should know that, so they'll know that in the future. Ritish, let's hear from you. Well, I think let's it's hard to, um, uh, you know, add on top <laughs> of all the great that. things that, that we've heard so much. What can I still add? I'm helping <laughs> your IPO. I'm not restricted. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what to ask anymore. <laughs> but, you know, I think I'll tell you this, that, um, you know, humility, absolutely, right? I think it just tells you that, you know, uh, we used to make business plans and aspirations about the future, about what the company will look like, and then something completely out of our control comes in, and like uh, Barry was saying, takes your revenue to, uh, you know, dramatically a, a different place. You'd have never imagined that. So I think humility is one. I think personally for me and our company, I think perseverance was probably one of the most important traits that I think we re-remembered. Because when we started our company, we had a lot of perseverance, because every day you have to come back and justify your existence. Uh, but of course, I think uh, we've, we've tried to persevere and, and, and see through the crisis. I'd probably say the third thing, and something that is, in my view, uh, prevalent for the future of our company, is the power of technology and products, right? I think fundamentally, it's easy for all of us in the industry to say that, well, it's the humans that matters and the technology is not that important. But reality of life is in our discussion today, we spend 50% of the time talking about technology. And you, before going to a destination, if your booking doesn't go through, you never show up at the destination. So you better get the technology right. Yeah. So I think that's an area that we've spent a lot of time uh, building. So for example, pre-pandemic, we used to reach out to our owners by means of physical salespeople. Now majority of our owners come, through, come to us through online self-serve, whereas they go online, use, buy our software and start using it. Um, we see consumer demand on mobile being probably higher than ever before. Uh, I think we have now 100 million downloads wow. on our app as the third most um, uh, download travel app. So I think technology, humility, and perseverance, those are the three learnings uh, I'd take away. And of course, I, I hope I can continue learning from people like Barry, uh, uh, Steve, and uh, others who, who, who do a fantastic job in what they do. Good luck, uh, Ritish. Thank you very much. So um, here are some uh, of the main messages that we've heard from our uh, panelists today to wrap up this uh, uh, panel. So human capital is the Can most... Can I add from a destination lens? What are the two lessons that I would like to add? Yeah, please go. And it's very difficult to still add, by the way. Yeah. But what I would say is tourism is not about visitors. Yes. It's also about residents. And that's the social sustainability we need to talk okay. about. It starts with the people of the place first. The second is the pandemic and, and any other crisis tells us that domestic tourism is not a tier two tourism. No. It is the most resilient and the most, you, uh, that will save you at times of crisis. So make sure you develop that tourism as in domestic and regional. So that's what I would say. Thank you. I'm just gonna add, them, I'm gonna add them to the messages. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, human capital is the most important element in tourism. Domestic uh, tourism is not tier two. Um, the sector is evolving and it will be very interesting to see what will happen. Uh, stay authentic, stay humble. Uh, the first and the last thing that you will remember is the smile on your host's face. And once again, tourism is too big to fail. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you for our beautiful panelists today for sharing their views thank you. Thank you so much. and experience. Thank you. <laughs> Good fun, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am being told that I need to remind you about being here tomorrow at 9 for the third day of the FII. Stay safe. <laughs>